Thanks, Will. Welcome, everybody. Yes, I'm a musculoskeletal and sports physician and a medical director of the Blackberry Clinic Group. And as you can see from the first slide, uh, a German philosopher, George Hegel, said, the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. Actually, history is very important when dealing with the lumbar spine. Socrates, who also uh, was a philosopher, Greek philosopher, never wrote anything down, however. He, he said that admitting ignorance is the first step towards wisdom, and I think he's probably right. But also, we used Socrates' name as an acronym or mnemonic for taking a history for anyone in pain. So, first of all, you ask the patient to point to where the pain is. That's probably about one of the most helpful uh, physical signs. Is it central or bilateral? Or unilateral or over the sacroiliac joint? There's a test called Fortin's finger test where he actually uh, described pointing to the sacroiliac joint as indicative of sacroiliac joint pain. Ask them for the, about the onset, uh, the duration, how long it's been going on for, how did it start, uh, the trauma involved, whether there's any trauma or whether it started slowly. And um, is there uh, an ache or a sharp pain? If it's a dull ache, it may be referred somatic pain. If it's sharp or burning, it may be radicular or perhaps neuropathic. And uh, is it continuous, uh, as in inflammatory pain, malignant pain, uh, or infection-related pain? If it's episodic or periodic, that may be an indication of segmental uh, or lumbar or discogenic instability. And how about the radiation? Where does the pain go? Does it go into the buttock or the thigh or the groin or down to the calf? If it goes below the knee, it's more likely to be radicular. And how about associated symptoms? A cough impulse or a pain on sneezing may imply a discogenic pain. Paresthesia and numbness may also imply the same. And muscle spasms are often accompanied by any, uh, or often accompany any acute pain. And A is also stands for age. Now, at over the age of 50, there is a greater than 50% chance that the pain that the patient is suffering from is facetogenic or from the sacroiliac joint, as opposed to disc pain. How about the time course? Apart from when did the pain start, what about has it been getting any worse? Has it been getting better? Uh, does it hurt the patient in the mornings particularly? That might imply discogenic pain. Morning stiffness for over 30 minutes may suggest an inflammatory spondylarthropathy. And pain at night may indicate a more sinister cause of pain, such as malignancy or maybe infection. So E stands for exacerbating factors and relieving factors. That's one of the most useful parts of the history, I find. So pain on walking, standing, and maybe extension suggests the posterior elements, the facet joints, uh, maybe a spondylotic type pain or a lytic stress fracture. Pain on sitting, prolonged sitting, or perhaps coughing, may suggest a discogenic type pain from a disc protrusion. And then I've changed the, uh, the, the commonly used mnemonic for S starting uh, to stand for systemic inquiry uh, and past medical history. So how about their general health, previous back problems and investigations, uh, such as uh, other problems such as osteoporosis and trauma? Have they suffered from scoliosis or malignancy in the past? Uh, do they suffer from cardiovascular disease, which might suggest an, uh, an aortic aneurysm is, is a possibility, because that can cause back pain? And any recent infections, because disc discitis is a rare cause of back pain, but worth bearing in mind. Apologies for all the writing on the slide, but I think it's a good aid memoir uh, in examination or history taking. Further elements of the history, what sort of medication is the patient on? Are they on steroids? Are they, are they likely to be suffering from uh, osteoporosis? Or anticoagulants, if there's an injection likely? And what type of job do they do? Does it involve heavy lifting, repetitive lifting, or repetitive bending? Um, are they involved in contact sports or repetitive sports? Uh, gymnastics and cricket bowling, repetitive extension like the, the, the tennis serve, all potentially causing stress fractures. 
um, and ask them about their training schedule and whether they take rest days. There's actually a limitation of the amount of uh, overs you're allowed to bowl in cricket uh, in certain uh, establishments uh, to, to provide a safe environment for the lumbar spine. Is there a family history of malignancy or arthritis? What kind of social context are you dealing with? Are they unemployed from a, a, a broken home, maybe a single parent? These are all risk factors for back pain and actually what I call, and actually is a very useful term, are obstacles to recovery. And the psychological history, uh, anxiety and depression, or other psychoses are all obstacles to recovery. Now, um, back pain is more common in smokers as is malignancy and osteoporosis and bone fractures and aortic aneurysms. Um, and then alcohol uh, tends or can cause osteoporosis and a greater incidence of falling and trauma. And IV drug use may lead to infections and discitis. Also ask the patient what are they expecting from the consultation? Uh, what are they worried about? What do they think their back is, is, is caused by? Uh, which is also a very useful question to ask when dealing with uh, the history of someone in pain. Now, Also, I find the flag system is very useful. Now, we all know the red flag system, uh, giving you an indication of perhaps called Requina syndrome uh, or um, serious pathology like, such as malignancy or serious infection. So you ask them about their sphincter control, about neurological deficit, um, night pain, weight loss, a history of cancer, and so on. So we all know the red flags, but there are other, there are other flags. There's a blue flag system where they're not happy at work. Their, their manager is on their case too much, and they're not enjoying their work. That is an obstacle to recovery. As are the yellow flags, um, aberrant attitudes and beliefs is a nice way of describing it. Uh, other words that I find useful, catastrophizing, Patients catastrophizing about their pain and what it might mean. Am I going to end up in a wheelchair? Hypervigilance, continuously talking about the pain in different parts of the body. Uh, and fear avoidance. Are they stopping, are they stopping all exercise and um, um, their work or, um, or sport because it might damage their back? And I'll, I'll, have they been diagnosed with anxiety or depression? Again, obstacles to recovery. And the black flags are just about litigation, um, any legal cases outstanding or controversies about the legal case or the, the length of time it's taking to settle the legal case. All of these are more obstacles to recovery. So why do we examine the patient if the history is giving us so much? Well, the examination also helps with the diagnosis and how disabled the patient is. It does actually improve the patient relationship, you know, the, the practitioner-patient relationship. They begin to trust you if you've examined them. How many times have you heard a patient say to you, I just went to this particular practitioner, they didn't even examine me. It also communicates your empathy towards their predicament. Some of the examination tests actually give you a valid test for the likelihood of that patient responding to a particular intervention. It gives you a, an objective measure that you can record uh, regarding the particular disability. And certain types of examination, known as the Waddell signs, which I'm not going to go into today, um, they are signs or tests you can do that give you an idea that the psychosocial issues need to be taken into consideration. Waddell initially described these and they became quite controversial and then they became discredited until he explained exactly what he meant. It isn't, they are not signs of malig uh, malingering, they are signs that the psychosocial issues need to be taken into account. And also the examination allows you to document your findings in case you have to produce a medico-legal report. So just before we do the physical examination, just a reminder on, uh, regarding some of these tests, they have validity, some of them, and they've been tested for that. Some of them have reliability, but not validity. Reliability means the 
the agreement between examiners and, and with one examiner also doing the same test repeated times, and that's often scored with a Kappa score. And the validity regarding uh, after a patient or other after a test has been done and it is reliable, only then can you go on and work out whether it's a sensitive test or a specific test. Sensitivity, the closer the number is to 100%, the more useful that test is as a screening tool. Um, in other words, the more useful it is if the, if the test is negative. And the specificity, the closer the uh, number is to 100%, uh, the more useful it is for, as to make a diagnosis if the test is positive. So on that note, I will ask Natasha to come up as my patient to demonstrate the standing exam. Now, although I'll talk about it for a while, Natasha, as the patient, has already walked onto the stage. I watched her demeanour. I saw whether she was in pain, maybe whether she was depressed, looking rather a flat affect. Was she walking with a Trendelenburg gait? Was she walking with an antal antalgic gait? And was she walking shifted over with a protective scoliosis? Now, I'll ask the patient to stand facing away from me. Can you come back a fraction, Natasha? That's it. That's good. So she's facing away from me. I'm going to look at a number of things uh, regarding posture. Um, as Matteo talked about, the side-on posture is useful to look at. Is there a kyphosis? Uh, is there a lordosis? What's the center of gravity like? Is it forward with protracted shoulders and protruding uh, chin? And then from behind, is there a scoliosis? Now, a scoliosis might be a protective scoliosis in that you've got muscle spasm and an acute pain, or it might be a um, functional scoliosis, which actually corrects when the patient sits down and levels the pelvis. It might be a structural scoliosis, in which case the patient sits down and it doesn't correct, or it may be transitional halfway between the two. Other things to look at, um, in terms of uh, posture and the pelvis are to look at the pelvic levels. So I'll put my thumbs underneath the posterior superior iliac spine, preferably not looking to start off with. I usually do this from an eye level, and then on the iliac crest, and then on the anterior superior iliac spine. Again, looking for the pelvic level, and an indication that a likely uh, leg length discrepancy is there. Those pelvic levels can also give you an idea of pelvic torsion, uh, or pelvic asymmetry. If the ASIS is lower and the PSIS is higher on the right, that suggests some anterior rotation or torsion of the pelvis, which may implicate uh, segmental dysfunction or rather sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Interesting to look at someone's feet because someone with overpronated feet, if you can just stand that way, if they've got overpronated feet, it can send the center of gravity forward. So if I look at Natasha's feet and decide they're overpronated, I might get her to correct them if you just move the talus into the neutral position. And if the patient just looks straight ahead, and if you relax your feet, you notice the center of gravity moves forward in quite a few people. That can increase your lordosis and increase the weight bearing on your posterior columns, the facet joints. Okay, let's, um, let's leave you in that position. Now I'm going to uh, do a few tests with her standing there before we do any flexion or extension tests. Can you stand on tiptoes? Okay, and down. We're testing S1, uh, plant affection of the foot. And can you walk around on tiptoes? Sometimes they cheat, so it's always worth checking that they can actually walk around on tiptoes. And then onto your heels and do the same thing. That's it. Testing L4, dorsiflexion of the ankle. If you're not sure about the actual uh, power loss in the S1 distribution, you can ask the patient to grab my hand, stand on tiptoe on one leg, on one leg, and then go up and down a few times. Most people should be able to get 10 to 15 of those toe raises in. That's enough, thank you. Um, 
if they tire quickly, you compare it to the other side. And it's a good way of picking up very subtle S1 weakness. I'm looking also, while standing here, at her poplar heel creases, the buttock creases, and checking that everything is symmetrical and not suggesting leg length discrepancy. Right, can you stand on one leg for me, please? Trendelenburg's test. Okay, and down. Turn face the other way. Just do the same again. Stand on one leg. And down. So I'm, what I'm looking for there is Trendelenburg's test. It's a weakness of the AB ductors, the abductors on the left side, suggesting anything from uh, arthritic um, problems in the hip or weakness of the abductors of the hip on, on the left side if the pelvic level drops down to the right. Okay, facing the other way again. From this position, I can now test lumbar flexion. So if you'd like to curl forwards the lumbar spine, I'm watching the quality of the movement, how far her hands go down towards her feet, and then come back up again. Looking at the, where the movement takes place, is it mostly hip movement or is it lumbar movement? There is a test called Sherber's test, facing this way again. Now the posterior superior iliac spines are there and there. The line between the two is your L5, S1 segment. I use a modified Sherber's test um, which is more practical uh, in the clinical situation, where I put my thumb there and the finger 10 centimetres above. Can you just flex forward again? And that distance should extend by 5 centimetres on full flexion. Come back up again. That, if it doesn't, it's a positive Sherber's test, suggesting anything from ankylosing spondylitis to acute muscle spasm, uh, restricting lumbar movement. Okay, facing this way again. So flex forward again, if you don't mind, Natasha, thank you. I'm now looking for any other signs. Come back up again. I'm asking for pain. Uh, where does the pain occur? Is there a painful arc on flexing forward? Is there a catch on flexing forward? Is there a deviation on flexing forward? All of these can suggest segmental instability uh, or discogenic pain. On deflection, when she comes back up again, is there a catch on coming back up? Is there, a, is, is there a shift on coming back up? Does she walk up her legs, which is called the Gower sign? Um, it's not a particularly valid test, but it suggests some segmental instability. So extension now. Um, if you'd like to bend back towards me. Extension, or, or if that's painful, it's more likely to represent pain from the facet joints and the posterior elements. Oblique extension, coming back to the right. Again, facet joints or po possibly a stress fracture in the lumbar spine on extension. You can do a test called the stalk test, which is not a particularly valid test, but it's useful. Even if tests are not valid in themselves, they're useful in association with signs from the history and other features of examination. So I'm just going to hold Natasha's shoulders, stand on one leg, and then arch back towards me and a little bit of rotation and ask for reproduction of their familiar pain. And that's, that's the stalk test. So side bending. So can you just turn that way? That's good. So side bending down to the right, looking at the uh, uh, smoothness of movement throughout the lumbar spine and to the left, asking for pain, seeing if there's a limitation of movement. Maybe it's an asymmetrical limitation. If it is actually symmetrical, it suggests a capsular limitation or a spondylotic type limitation of lumbar movements. So I think we've finished the standing exam. If I could have the next slide, please, uh, for the sitting exam. So if you'd like to sit on the couch facing that way, that's good. So sitting well back on the couch, there's a few tests that can be done in this position. The first one you might want to do is the knee jerk reflex L3-4. Now you'll see Natasha's reflexes are not particularly good. You can facilitate uh, or sensitize reflexes by asking the patient to clasp her hands together. And if you now pull, it facilitates the reflex. And that is a useful one to do if, because a quite surprising number of people don't have very good reflexes. From this position, 
we can check L1-2 uh, hip flexion. So if you lift your knee up here, resist me pushing it down. And on this side, resist me pushing it down. That's good. We can test L3-4 knee extension, the quadriceps power. Try and extend your knee. That's good. And on this side. And then we can move to a useful test, probably one of the most useful tests uh, in examination of the lumbar spine, which is the slump test. So hands behind your back, slump down as if you'd fallen asleep, let your head drop. Now, I extend the, the knee to the point where pain is reproduced, and dorsiflex the foot, should accentuate the familiar radicular pain. That can be sensitized by internally rotating the leg and adducting, adducting the hip. Okay, come back up again. The important thing with this test is to ask the patient, does that reproduce your familiar pain? Because a patient who just says that hurts is not very helpful. You have to ask whether it is reproducing their pain. Can we do the test again? Hands behind your back. Extend the knee, dorsiflex the foot. And then if the pain is reproduced, lift your chin up and ask what, that happens to, what happens to the pain, and then lower the chin back down again. Okay, so if the pain is improved, reduced by lifting the chin up, and made worse by dropping the chin back down again, that is a positive test. At this position, um, we can also test a passive internal rotation of the hip, if the, you're suspecting that hip joints may be a problem. So radicular pain, down the leg, reproducing their sharp burning pain, that's made worse on the slump test, suggests we may be dealing with a disc protrusion. So that concludes the examination of uh, the sitting patient. So let's have you lying down now, Natasha. So with the lying patient, before we even start with the reflexes. There are a few things we can do to examine the, the patient, who may be a cardiovascular patient, a cardiovascular risk. We may want to do an abdominal examination looking for masses, aortic aneurysms and hernias and so on. You may want to take the pedal pulses for someone at cardiovascular wrist, uh, a risk um, with intermittent claudication. Let's just do the reflexes while we're here. S1, ankle jerk, both sides. Let's ask Natasha to facilitate that again, just with your hands. Pull hard. And on this side. Still not so good. Okay, put that down. Actually, before we, before we do that, we just check the plantar reflexes, the Babinski sign for upper motor neuron lesions. And remember clonus. Clonus can be very helpful. Uh, just check for clonus. More than two beats of clonus may suggest an upper motor neuron lesion. While we're doing the neurological testing, light touch in the L3 dermatome, L4 dermatome, L5 dermatome, and S1 on the outside of the foot. Remember to test those. And we're now going to test for power. So if you'd like to lift your ankle up like that, I'm resisting ankle dorsiflexion. Hold it, hold it where it is and resist me pushing it down. That's it, and on this side, hold it up, resist me pushing it down. It's actually best to say to people, hold it there, resist me pushing it, because if you say to the patient, lift it up or push it up, you may get all sorts of actions. So L4, ankle dorsiflexion. L5 is hallux dorsiflexion, the big toe. Resist me pushing it down. That's good. Now you can do the re knee reflexes from this position. I'll do that just for sake of completeness. L3-4. Now from this position also, if we're considering excluding a hip joint as a cause of pain, we can do a log roll. That means grabbing both feet and rolling the hips, which actually excludes the lumbar spine in that movement. And if you think there is a restriction of movement in the capsular pattern, which is mostly internal rotation regarding the hip joint, 
um, that may suggest hip joint pathology. While the patient is supine, we haven't done any further movements yet, you can do one of the sacroiliac joint pain provocation tests, which is anterior superior iliac spine distraction or compression. If that reproduces the patient's familiar sacroiliac joint pain, that's a positive test. Now, Laslett described six tests, um, which I will be covering today. Three of those tests being positive may suggest pa the pain is originating from the sacroiliac joint. And my own interpretation is that if you have less than those, uh, that three uh, sacroiliac joint provocation test positive, the pain may actually be coming from the sacroiliac ligaments, but not enough research has been done on the sacroiliac ligaments. So from this position, we also have one to check their leg lengths. So bend your knees up, lift your bottom an inch off the ground, and drop it down, and then straighten your legs. Quick check to make sure the line between the anterior superior iliac spines is perpendicular to the couch. And then pop your thumbs underneath the medial malleolus and you can check uh, to see if there is a leg length deficiency. That's by far the, the best way of checking uh, by eye. Using a tape measure means you've got an error of about one centimetre at both ends and you come up with some spurious results. So we've checked her leg legs now. Now we're gonna do the straight leg raise. So just relax your leg. So we're looking for radicular pain, suggesting a disc protrusion, and uh, asking for reproduction of the pain. Is there any pain there? No, and if there is pain, you can uh, sensitize that test with dorsiflexion of the foot, otherwise known as Braggard's test. So from this, this position, if you've already excluded that radicular pain, you can then fully flex the hip, checking for a capsular pattern of restriction of hip movement, familiar to people with arthritic hips. And at the same time, you can rotate the hip externally. Pain on full external rotation may imply a gluteus medius tendinopathy or trochanteric bursitis. Internal restriction of movement, a hard end feel, feel for the, how it actually feels right at the end of the range, and pain may suggest that capsular pattern of restriction in arthritic hips. Now from this position, we can also internally rotate the hip, adduct, flexion, adduction, internal rotation, otherwise known as the Fadir test, and compression, which actually tests for femoris tabular impingement or labral tears. Now in this neutral position of the hip, we can also do a thigh thrust, which is the, um, the sacroiliac joint pain provocation test, probably one of the better ones. Direct axial thrust through, down through the femur, asking for reproduction of their familiar pain. That can be modified by holding back on the contralateral ASIS. And another way of doing the thigh thrust test is by actually holding back on the sacrum and shearing the sacroiliac joint on, the, on that side. Again, looking for reproduction of their familiar pain. Now, with the, the leg up at this position, we're doing this in the routine that you do it in a clinical examination, so uh, hopefully it's all clear that it's running smoothly. So uh, we can do Patrick's figure four or uh, Faber test, flexion, abduction, external rotation. So that's with the foot on the contralateral knee, hold down on the uh, ipsilateral knee and the contralateral ASIS, press down and ask for reproduction of pain, again, around the SI joint. Some patients will tell you it's hurt, painful in the, in the groin, which is not particularly helpful. It's more suggestive of hip joint pathology, that. But if it's painful uh, around the uh, sacroiliac joint on the ipsilateral side, that suggests uh, a positive test. So that's the uh, Patrick's figure four test. Now, um, the next test is called Gainsland's test. So if you could just shift slightly that way, and that's good. If you can now grab your right knee and then drop your left knee over the couch. This is a shearing test for the, sac the left sacroiliac joint. I'm pressing down, extending the left hip and looking for reproduction of the characteristic sacroiliac joint pain on the ipsilateral side, which is her left side. Okay, come back again. So again, that's one of the six sacroiliac joint pain provocation tests that I've uh, outlined. 
I think we've covered the uh, supine testing. Can we have the next slide, which was um, actually outlining all of those tests? So again, lots of information on one slide, but actually useful for an aid memoir when you're doing the examination. I think we've covered almost all of those, apart from the active straight leg raise. Pregnant mums, or peripartum mums, quite often suffer from sacroiliac joint pain, perhaps about 20 or 30% of them. And in their uh, situation, then raising a leg, if you raise this leg straight, an active straight leg raise can feel very diff d different on one side. And back down again. It can either feel very difficult or painful uh, if they have got sacroiliac dys dysfunction on one side. If you then compress the pelvis and ask them to do the same thing again, just lift it up to 45 degrees and down. And if that movement becomes easier and less painful by compressing the sacroiliac joint, the suggestion is that they're suffering from SI joint dysfunction. But that's been validated, that test, only in peripartum uh, patients. OK, so I think that completes the, the lying exam. And so we'll do the side lying exam. Can we have the next slide, please? Sorry, I beg your pardon, prone. We need the, the prone exam is the next one. OK. And I'll just take that pillow away. OK, so the prone exam. Make sure the patient's comfortable lying prone. The first thing I do is flex both knees. Now, this particular manoeuvre is a combination of tests. First of all, it's testing whether the hip flexors are tight on one side or the other, or the knee extensors can happen in OA hip and other conditions. At the same time, what it does is also test for facet joint pain. Somebody with facet joint pain in the lumbar spine will find that is actually a painful manoeuvre in the lumbar spine because it tilts the pelvis forwards anteriorly, loading the facet joints. So at the same time, you're actually doing a bilateral femoral stre stress uh, test or femoral stretch test. But if you are suspicious of radicular pain in the L3 um, dermatome, myotome, then um, be careful with that and actually do a single-legged femoral stretch test because a, a disc protrusion at L3-4 uh, or L2-3 may produce quite severe burning pain down the front of the thigh with this test. And if it if it doesn't or you're still concerned, you can actually sensitize it by lifting the, the knee. So from this position, we can also do um, a uh, test for power, the hamstrings, S1, um, and hold your foot there. Resist me pushing it down. Again, I asked her to hold that there, resist me pushing it down so she knew what I wanted her to do. And hold it there, resist me pulling it up. And we're testing L3 quadriceps. At the same time, we can do a light touch in the S1 dermatome, uh, checking for that. Um, S12 also supplies the gluteal muscles, so lift your leg up straight behind you and resist me pushing it down. That is a resisted test for glutes, S12, or you can ask them just to clench the buttock muscles up and you'll notice a decrease in tone if there's a significant uh, radiculopathy. Right, from this position here, we can now test another sacroiliac joint pain provocation, which is called the test, which is called the sacral thrust, which is direct downward pressure on the sacrum. And you ask for a reproduction of their sacroiliac, unilateral sacroiliac pain. Moving up to the lumbar spine, what I then move on to is um, an AP springing with the ulnar border of your hand using straight arms because your large joints have more proprioceptors in your own body so you can feel for end feel for range of motion you ask for pain at different segmental levels now this is otherwise known as the uh, pavum passive accessory intervertebral motion palpation uh, in physiotherapy world but it also can be used as a prone instability test. Now I use a modified prone instability test. So if you're pressing down there and you produce quite a nasty pain, you then ask the patient to lock both knees and lift both legs up an inch. And then reproduce the same movement 
and relax and ask whether that actually imp whether the pain improved and for anyone with quite significant sagittal translatory instability um, that lifting the legs isometrically contracts the erector spinae and obliterates that pain it's quite it's traditionally described with a patient bending over the couch but actually I found this much more convenient way of testing that the next thing to do is feel for um, a little bit of light touch, and as Matteo was describing, the, the skin drag, which can be present in patients with segmental dysfunction around the lumbar spine. Then feel deep, more deeply for lumbar erector spiny muscle tone, and also for pain, tenderness, trigger points. Trigger points can also be felt around the uh, gluteus medius uh, origin or the insertion on the trochanter and also around the PSIS, which is where the sacroiliac joint actually is. And then further up, around the PSIS, where the ilia lumbar ligament is, the posterior sacroiliac ligaments. Feel for tenderness there. Then moving up over the facet joints. Now the facet joint landmark is 2.5 centimeters lateral to the interspinous line at each level. So I press two, with two thumbs, looking for tenderness and also uh, muscle tone and, and, and uh, end feel at those levels, down on both sides. Okay, so that completes the prone exam. So now we'll do the sideline exam. If I can have the next slide, please. Now, sideline exam, um, favoured by osteopaths and physios and chiropractors. Um, you grab the knees with your left arm, feet with the right arm, and you're allowing the knees to rest against your lateral thigh at the same time as palpating. Before I do that, I just move the patient slightly towards me and palpate the uh, PSIS, both sides, and the line between the two, if you remember, is the L5-S1 segment. Then from that position, you can then use flexion movements, this is otherwise known as motion palpation or passive uh, interver physiological intervertebral motion palpation or PIVMs for those physios amongst us. And this is a valid test, particularly looking for alignment and contour and whether you can pick up a step or a spondylolisthesis uh, and the range of motion at each segmental level. And you can pick up some people with quite hypermobile segments by doing this. Now, at the same point, you can reverse that, have the knees against your lateral other thigh, and assess it in extension. And apparently, the pivens uh, or motion palpation is more valid in this position, in extension, looking for sagittal translatory instability, hypermobility, or, or uh, spondylolisthesis. In that position, too, you can also uh, test for muscle tone and tenderness. And there's one more sacroiliac joint pain provocation test, which, which we did supine, but you can e more easily do it uh, side-lying. That is with your forearm over the fleshy abductors of the hip, and then compress the pelvis and ask for reproduction of their familiar pain in their back. And that is the ASIS compression test. That's one of the pain provocation tests for the sacroiliac joint. So that completes the examination of the lumbar spine. Thank you.